appreciate that. We are very excited to be here with you. Uh, unfortunately, Kristen could make it, but that's also the life of a mid-manager. Sometimes there are competing pieces that come up. So we're just going to go ahead and jump right in and we'll share our learning outcomes quickly. So first, uh, we want participants to be able to understand how middle managers have to be skilled in the delicate role of taking values and expectations from above and then translating them to practical realities. That's such a huge piece of the middle management role. Uh, we're also going to have you hear a variety of perspectives of what it's like to be an upper mid-level professional. And then we hope to give you some tips on your way out on how to prepare for that position. Or if you're newly into the role, what are some, some tools that you can add to your toolkit as you are working through the mid-manager role. But before we get into that presentation and our questions, we're going to look at fries because it's right before lunch and I'm hungry. So take a look at these fries. Don't they look yummy? What kind of fry are you right now? What kind of fry are you feeling? You can put it in the chat box there. You can put a number. You can say maybe why you're feeling that fry right now. Oh, we got some curly fries. Yes, lots of number threes. Oh, six is showing up a lot. Five guys, very good. Lots of Chick-fil-A, always a winner. Oh, someone said they're a particular type because they really need comfort. Yes. <laughs> Number six. Oh, I like that, Kelly. Round, it rolls, and it keeps on going. <laughs> yes, certainly feels like that some days. Someone's missing being near an eight. Whataburger, that's right on my way home. So when I have late nights, it's very easy for me to hit up Whataburger. <laughs> very nice. So lots of different fries here. And I think as, as mid-managers, we also are like fries coming in all different shapes and sizes. Sometimes we feel fried right? Because of everything that's going on. Sometimes we're like, we need our comfort food. Uh, so lots of comparisons that you can make from fries to a mid-manager. So that's why we wanted to kick off that day and also since it's our last session here. But we'll begin doing some actual introductions and then we'll head into kind of the meaty part. My name is Rachel Blakesley, and I currently serve as the Associate Director for Residential Student Experience at Florida State. I became a mid-manager um, a little bit later than some of my contemporaries, so six years post-masters. Um, when I became an Assistant Director, I did a couple of years as an entry-level hall director, and then a few more as a Residence Life Coordinator over several different areas and graduate students, so kind of like some little baby steps in there, making it to the assistant director position. Things I love. I love my family. So of course I had to throw up a picture of my four kids. They're wonderful. Um, ministry, camping. I love puns. Anyone who knows me knows that I will give you lots of good puns. Um, empowering other and others and Diet Dr. Pepper. My mid-manager pet peeve is having a decision but no context that I can use to get my staff on board. I see some people shaking their heads there, you know what I mean. And then my tip for mid-managers is being a mid-manager is sometimes less about balance and more about infusion. So one of the pictures that I was really tempted to put up there was a picture of me and my, my two oldest, my boys wearing our FSU caps, and we were at a baseball game which was part of an event where we hosted some RAs from Rose Holman and had them come down and stay the weekend with us and do some cross training with our RAs. And we took them to a baseball game and I got to bring some of my kids, right? So sometimes, you know, when we think about balance, sometimes we think about boundaries and having really hard boundaries. But I have found for me that the times that I can infuse all different pieces of me, whether it's my family, my values, um, even faith, if I can infuse that into the work that I'm doing, that that helps me stay refreshed. And that actually helps my well-being to be able to put those together. And now I will pass it off to Sean. Thank you so much. So we are super excited that each of you are here. So as you guys already know, I am Sean Odom. I do have the pleasure of serving as the Associate Director for University Housing here at Florida A&M University. 
Um, I became a VA manager four years post master's degree as an assistant director. And then 10, I've been in the field for 10 years. Um, I chose to put my fraternity picture uh, as a part of my welcome, a little bit about me. So I'm originally from North Carolina. Uh, coming to Florida was different for me because I don't have family here. But my fraternity brothers was welcome me open arms. Um, so as we continue to go through the presentation, you're hearing more about having someone to process with outside of your particular unit of operation. So they are that for me. Um, so that's why that's there. I love my family, my friends, of course, my fraternity. I enjoy traveling. I enjoy development of students and staff. Um, I think that is important as a mid manager because you have to develop your, it's your responsibility to develop your employees, right? Because you want them to, at one day, have the desire to take your position. Uh, one of my pet peeves is when a team member doesn't communicate their needs. Um, and you'll probably hear more about this throughout the presentation. Uh, one of the things that I think people sometimes assume is because we are mid-managers that we automatically know what your needs are, what you're feeling, when you need support, or when you need an extension on the deadline, but it's a partnership. So we'll keep going. But my tip is always take care of your people and they will take care of you. I believe when you take care of your team members, they'll do anything you ask them to do and more. And I'll pass it on. Hi everyone, my name is Natalie Record and I'm the Associate Director of Residence Life at Florida Gulf Coast University. I became a mid-manager four years post-masters and um, as an assistant director, and then I've been in the field for 13 years. So part of the reason why we wanted to start off with these slides is also to show that mid-managers are humans too, right? You know, we, sometimes I think people feel like we not enjoy making hard decisions, but we don't think about the impact that it makes on people. But no, we're humans, we have feelings, things of that nature. So for my loves, um, family, friends, working out at Pure Bar, um, that is kind of my mental escape. And then my dogs and a cat. And so I chose to, as again, you can see the professional headshot of me. And then you also see one of my running pictures when I finished a marathon. So again, we're, we're people too. Mid-manager pet peeve, carrying out a hard decision and that I had no part in making. Um, part of the reason why this is incredibly challenging is because me as a supervisee, I never wanna throw my supervisor under the bus or their up chain under the bus. And so, you know, if I have to um, give the decision and then give the reasoning for the decision, that's part of my role as a mid-manager. And so I try to do that as, um, realistic with my staff, but also diplomatically with my team as well. And then my tip for be, kind of being a man manager, some days you have to be your own biggest fan. Um, I would say that I'm a very down to earth person, so I don't have a big ego, but everybody has an ego. And so, you know, there you will receive comments as a mid manager that you're like, wow, that kind of hurt. And so some days you'll walk away from the office being like, you know what, I'm going to live to see another day. And um, I, I did the best that I could ultimately. All right, so um, to kind of give our presentation some teeth, we wanted to talk a little bit about the research and what the research says on mid-managers. Um, there is more research out there on mid-managers than one would assume. And so if you're thinking about getting a terminal degree and mid-managers is a topic area that you're passionate about, you could definitely add to the field of research. Um, there's a fair amount of attrition in the field at the mid-manager level. And you know, part of that is when you go um, through the job search as an entry-level housing person, there are 20 million jobs for, you know, entry-level RDs, things of that nature. But then our field, well, our functional area within student affairs definitely has a funneling effect. And so, you know, people can kind of be at these mid-manager points for a long time in their career. And I would say, you know, being a mid-manager for a long time isn't a bad thing, but find other things that get you passionate, get you excited, get you rejuvenated about your job. Um, part of the reason why I complete, completed my dissertation when I did is that was to help me get excited and keep me current on what was going on. And then, like I said, there's definitely more research that's needed. And, and so if you're thinking about a dissertation topic, um, I think mid-manager would be a good one. So next slide. The research. So part of being a manager is playing the difficult role of both supervisor and supervisee, right? You're right in the mid-manager, mid-level. If you think about it in some ways, your supervisor is a mid-manager too, 
right? They have a boss and then they also have to communicate down to us as the supervisees. Um, learning how to communicate from your supervisor to your supervisee is really important. I think in a lot of ways, I'm almost like a translator. And so I may get much more of the bigger picture as to what's going on, but not all those details can be shared with kind of the staff that is um, under me. And so leaving out what isn't necessary, keeping what's important, but again, kind of serving as that translator. Um, supporting decisions that we were not involved in. Again, we talked about that being a pet peeve, but that is definitely one of the qualities of being a mid-manager. Next slide. Um, so you have to be skilled in both people management and providing leadership for your area. I don't know if you all have heard of the researchers, Saunders, Cooper, Winston, and Chernow. Um, they did a lot of research on supervision back in the early 2000s. And so again, if you're interested in that, you can kind of go look them up. They talk a lot about synergistic supervision, which is a style that I typically um, try to incorporate in the work that I do. But yeah, so you've got to provide leadership and you've got to manage folks and you can do one or the other well, but Goodman managers try to find a balance with that. Um, you've got to know how to help your staff set um, goals and that could be goals formally within an HR process or it could be goals kind of informally. So you know that they're not going to be RDs or whatever your entry level position is for forever. And so how can you kind of help them set those goals where they can start um, getting the skills that they need in order to advance and then holding folks accountable. Um, I think sometimes as supervisors, we go into it because of the people development and we get really passionate about that. And that's the exciting part, but holding people accountable also includes the people development piece. And so I think sometimes in our field, because we are so caring, we um, shy away from holding folks accountable. But if you think about that, that's really an opportunity for folks to grow, not only for the people who need to, I don't wanna say change, but maybe hone their skills differently, but also for you as a supervisor, it's really, easy to be a supervisor when the relationship is going great, but are you a good supervisor when the relationship is challenging? And I think that is something that um, we as supervisors need to work on. Next slide. And then again, influencing the staff's happiness and productivity in their role. You know, I would say that COVID is an indefinite example where the staff hasn't necessarily been happy and that's definitely impacted their productivity. I remember a project that I asked my team to do, and I think with COVID, you know, we are so in the weeds of just making sure that Maslow's hierarchy of needs are met. Then we were talking about programming, it almost felt like this extra weight because they were like, wait, I'm just trying to make sure that my residents are healthy. And then now you're asking me to engage with them. Like it was almost just kind of too much. And so, um, we want the residents to be happy, but it's almost a trickle down effect. If our RDs aren't happy, then that's not gonna happy for that's not gonna happen for the other staff. And then again, I've already kind of talked about this, but just the high attrition rate in student affairs and housing and residence life in general. You know, if you talk to people who used to work in housing and then now maybe they're a dean of students, they talk about it like they kind of got out of war, right? They're like, oh, I used to do that, like, mm, not anymore. And so what are you doing as a professional where you can rejuvenate yourself so you can be a good supervisor, good role model to the entry-level staff um, so they can kind of trickle down to the RAs? And then next slide. Awesome. So here's the opportunity that we want to have a conversation, right? This is an opportunity for you to ask some questions in the chat and we will continue to monitor it. Um, but we already have some pre-prepared questions that we will discuss and hopefully click something for you. So one of the question is, what is the most challenging aspect of being a middle manager? So I'll kick it off. So for me, I would probably say uh, COVID kind of created a whole nother monster in this role because you have to think about the whole big picture, the whole element, right? You have to think about the on-campus moving process. You got to think about health and safety inspections. How is programming going to work um, for your student staff? You got to think about the safety of your staff. You got to make sure you have all the PPE, everything in place. You got to think about from the housekeeper lens. Like there are so many moving pieces and it's like you think you have 10 things off your list and 25 more things are going to come. Not to mention, you also got to present a report or prepare a plan for your VP to share with the president and the reopening committee. So there's a lot of moving pieces. Um, so I will say in this particular moment, COVID has probably been the most challenging thing in my role because you don't, there are some things that you think you have everything together, but then there are some things that you don't necessarily think off the top of your head that could be a little small detail that matters the most. 
Um, for example, it could have been signage. Did I have enough signage to make clear direction so people understood? Or did we articulate expectations about moving early so that parents at home understood what the process looks like? Because it's totally different. Uh, so that's just one example for me. And then I'll let Natalie and Rachel jump in. Do you want me to go, Rachel? Oh, okay. Um, I think another hard part about um, the mid-manager level is the indirect supervision to not the folks that you supervise, but the folks underneath them. You know, what kind of relationships are you creating with them? How does that impact the relationship that you have with your direct reports? You know, if you feel like your direct report may be going down an incorrect path and in how they're supervising them, how do you convey that, but still allow that supervisor the autonomy to make the decisions they need? Um, and so I think something that we don't necessarily always talk about is that indirect supervision and how hard that is. I think when that indirect supervision is an RA, it's a little bit different just because the RA role, you know, is kind of at an annual cycle and you may get those RAs back, you may not. But when those indirect supervisees are professional staff member, how are you creating relationships with them where they know they can come to you, but at the same time, it doesn't take away um, your supervisee's authority who supervises them. To kind of jump off of that, I would say that that was one of the hardest transitions that I had to figure out when I moved into a mid-manager role. A lot of times I'll get questions from my supervisors about a particular issue and they're like, what happened with this? Right. And my, in, my natural inclination, because they typically want that information right then, because maybe right. their boss is asking them, right. would be just to call the person who was involved and be like, hey, tell me some more about what was mm -hmm. happening. I just want to understand. I think I'm a pretty friendly person, you know, so I've always been able to have those conversations. Well, I'm not worried about it, but I had to have some of my staff members tell me, Rachel, look, that's my person and you just skipped me, right? Mm -hmm. And they were a little freaked out that you were calling them instead of their supervisor calling them. And I'm like, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to be scary. Like for me, I thought I was just resolving an issue mm -hmm. quickly for my supervisors, but by not respecting kind of that chain of supervision, mm -hmm. it ended up being more intimidating than I anticipated for those staff members um, that I was working with. And so that was a really big adjustment for me in how to work through that process effectively, but in also ways that were not intimidating or, or nerve wracking for others. All right, good. good. You guys are submitting some great questions, keep them coming. So one is, one question is, what is something you wish you would have known before moving into a mid manager role? Um, so for me, uh, something that I wish I would have known is the amount of time that you have to spend sometimes on dealing with personnel matters. Um, I think that you don't really think about that piece when you decide that you want to move into it because a lot of times it's handled. Before you became a manager, it was handled. You never saw what really happened. Uh, but one of the one of the main things I would say is the ability to manage people and personalities because everyone is not going to uh, click automatically and trying to get everyone to kind of see the bigger picture, but also being able to manage <laughs> manage some expectations, but managing people. I wish I would have known that coming in that the hardest part of your job is going to be managing personal. We have another question. How do you rally your teams in time of change? I think in some ways, you know, in terms of how to rally, I think in terms of communication, like I'm pretty big on it. Like if there are things coming down the pipe, like we have kind of what we call residence life, all staff meetings, and that's everybody that's a part of residence life. And so really trying to pre present the idea in a um, transparent way with everybody present at the same time, also giving my direct supervisees some of the information because mm -hmm. it's it's kind of hard for those that I supervise to be in the room and hearing the information at the same time. Sometimes it makes them feel like they're not assistant directors. It makes them feel like they're, you know, the entry level staff, the RD team. And so, um, but trying to get a lot of the questions out on the table, being transparent and authentic with an ant, like if they ask a question that I don't know, just saying, I don't know the answer to that, but um, that's you. something that maybe wasn't considered. And I'll take that back up and, and see if we can address that. Um, and then I try to really do some small things that um, 
just get them excited about the the work they do and how also asking them to come up with those ideas because I think they sometimes I think when you ask those questions folks don't know what they want to see yes. in terms of appreciation and they'll yes. tell you like we don't know yes. but um when they can be a part of the solution I think that makes everybody feel a lot more bought in so those are some things that I have um and I've been through a lot of change as a mid-manager so for folks familiar with Georgia I went through a consolidation with another um, Georgia school which was challenging FLSA implementation um so those are some and covid i mean those are probably the top three when we really had to rally kind of um folks in the residence life area we have another question how do you navigate playing the game as a mid manager without your supervisees feeling as if their voice isn't heard because they don't have a seat at the table great question i think that's a wonderful question um, I think one of the ways that I try to approach that is whenever, in the same way that Natalie was talking about, whenever there is an opportunity for them to have a seat at the table, to be able to start giving them those opportunities, whether that's through work groups, hey, we, we, we know we made the decision to put this new position into effect. This is a recent one at our institution. We're overhauling our um, receptionist and night staff programs and putting together a desk assistant position. Um, so we know you weren't there for that part of the decision that the other pieces were happening, but we would love for you to help us design what the job description is. And so here are some resources from other institutions that have similar positions. Take a look at them, pull out what you think might work for us. Let's talk about, let's add some pieces in and to get them involved in those ways so that while they may not be there for every single decision that's made, that they're still a part of the process and there's still some ownership there. And I think that helps. The other thing I think we find sometimes is when when our staff, especially our entry level staff or even our student staff are asked to participate in it, they start to realize how challenging it can be, mm -hmm. right? And then it helps them give us a little bit more grace. Um, it also helps them um, get excited though about it as well. And we have some good conversations that go, come out of that. Awesome. What kind of professional development opportunities do you have access to and or choose to pursue? I um, was able to go to the Mid Managers Institute that's put on by SAXA. And I would say outside of Relay, like that's probably been the most um, developmental thing in my experience. And while it wasn't necessarily housing and residence life focused, of course, housing and residence life people were there. I mean, um, vice presidents, you know, students, they were kind of the faculty for the MMI experience. And then just the topics that they talked about. So politics um, and, and navigating politics was one of the topics at MMI. Um, it also gave me a lot of um, self assurance that I'm not the only one kind of experiencing what's going on in some of these challenges. Mm -hmm. And so another thing about being a mid-manager is it's very kind of lonely. And so with Rachel and Sean and I kind of putting this presentation together, you know, we talked a lot about, wouldn't it be great if we chatted more or had more yes. connection so we could just share, hey, my day was really hard and listen to this mm -hmm. craziness that that's going on at my campus. Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily to bad mouth your institution, right. but it's just to kind of have the camaraderie of, hey, I work in housing too. I know yeah. what it's like to do what you're doing. So um, MMI is definitely an experience that I thought was um, phenomenal. And um, if you all are able to take that experience, I would definitely, when we're able to have those again, I would definitely go for it. Yes. Do you have any tips on how to handle the negative attitude of a supervisor so it doesn't trickle down to those you supervise? Hmm. That is such a great question. I love that question because, you know, leadership really does make a difference when it comes to the culture and to the attitude. And if you're seeing that in someone else, I think a big piece is also just remembering that your supervisor is human. And sometimes yes. we really forget that. Um, and so being able to sit down and talk with them, hey, how was your day? I had a supervisor once that I really had to work very hard building relationships with, and it took a while. And what I started doing, and I actually got this from my partner, because, you know, I'm a, I'm a talking person. My supervisor does not like to talk about feelings at that time, the supervisor that I had. And so anytime it looked like he was having a rough day, I would bring in a Diet Coke and a Reese's and just put it on his desk. Sometimes he was there, sometimes he wasn't there, but those were two of his favorite things and I would just go put it on his desk. And finally, a couple weeks in, he um, 
he saw me put it on his desk and he's like, I've been kind of crabby today, haven't I? I said, mm-hmm, you sure <laughs> have. <laughs> and, I wa- and I walked out. But, you know, the next time that we met, we were finally able to have some conversations about what was kind of going on with him, what were some of the things that he was struggling with, and then what could I do as his supervisee to help lighten the load, right? You know, was it that everybody was asking questions and the only answer he was allowed to get from his boss was no, and he kept having to be the no man, and he did not like being the no man right? How can I take some of that pressure off of him? How can we help our staff kind of understand maybe more about our financial situation and what's going on? So while we love this idea, how can we translate that into something that is more feasible for us to do given our finances so that he no longer had to be the no man. Instead, we were problem solving together as a team, Mm -hmm. right? And and that was made such a huge difference, not only in the relationship that he and I had, it became much more open, um, Mm -hmm. but also that his relationship and his interactions with our team members began to improve. When you have to deliver information or decisions others have made, Uh, that people have a negative reaction to, how do you handle carrying that emotional burden of being the bad guy to hundreds of people? Great question. Man, I really had to think about that one. Um, I think that goes back to kind of why in our presentation we, we talked a little bit about things that we love because that really rejuvenates me and almost kind of helps balance me out when work is is challenging or when um, I'm delivering a message that the, that the that I know that the staff is not going to take well mm-hmm. um, and also the hard part in delivering messages that the staff isn't going to take well I may agree that the decision was not the best decision But at the same time, kind of going back to me not wanting to throw either my supervisor or folks above that person under the bus, um, trying to deliver the message diplomatically and still, you know, hearing them out. Um, So I think that is how I handle it, working out. um, That I think has really helped. And then again, just trying to find your network of folks that you can kind of vent to. Um, I am a little bit of a venter. Like, I'll just admit that. Um, It does not mean that everything is horrible. Things are are great, but I just want to kind of get this off my chest. Um, And I think, you know, Rachel just talked a little bit about the relationship that she had with her supervisor. I think it's really important to develop a relationship with your supervisor where you can vent safely, but both of you know that things are going to be okay and that you're going to go out and carry out the work that you need to do. And so, um, you know, when I'm venting, it doesn't mean that I dislike my institution or I'm going to have these feelings long. Usually it's just, let me get this off my chest and then I'm fine. Like I'll go back out and I'll go back and do the work that I need to do. So I hope that was helpful. That, that is a really hard question. Whoever answered that, whoever asked that question. Yeah. Um, Our next question is what is the balance you have found for advocating for your staff? Uh, One of the things that I particularly do is I always tie everything back to the mission and the strategic plan. And as long as you align things up to that, it seems to have worked well for me. Uh, But Rachel Knapp, if you have anything to add to that. I think you're right on point there. Um, Part of it is is choosing your battles, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And figuring out what's in your control. So there may be some things that they're asking for that is totally within your power to do and make it happen, right? What are those small wins that you can do? Or maybe you can't do this big thing that they're asking for. Maybe HR rules are standing in your way. That's a common one for a lot of institutions. You know, what is HR going to allow you to do to support your staff? So if you can't do that one, what are some alternative things that you can do and figuring out what that looks like? And I think part of it also is the messaging, right? Mm -hmm. And so, especially being in the middle, you're dealing with very different generations that have different perspectives on work and what people owe their employers versus what employers owe them. So if we look at a lot of the folks that are above us, um, many are from a generation where you owe your employer this work and in return, your employer's gonna give you a paycheck. And that's Mm -hmm. what your employer owes you, is simply that paycheck but you owe the work. From a lot of our staff, especially our entry level staff, 
the, it, the mindset is changed a little bit differently, right? It is, right. I'm going to work hard, but it is my employer's responsibility to make sure that my environment is set up for me to be successful. Mm-hmm. So my employer owes me. And so sometimes you get those, what can at times be very opposing views in your institution. And as Mm -hmm. the middle manager, it's about figuring out how can I translate the needs both ways? Yeah. And and, and it just comes back to being that translator again and figuring out what are some ways that we can meet in the middle and how can I help both sides see the perspective so that, so that we can work better together. Our next question is, how do you pour from an empty cup? How do you prevent your cup from emptying so that you can provide the best support and energy for your staff when you may not feel you are getting the support yourself? Great question. Um, I think definitely in times of COVID, I feel like I've been pouring from an empty cup. Um, You know, working hard Monday through Friday on the weekends, I really wouldn't do a whole lot. But other than watch TV, just because I just needed kind of some mindless, um, just things to just be mindless and not have to make any sort of decision. Um, I think when you feel like you're getting that way, it's probably, if you can, reevaluate what's going on and try to get you get some assistance for whatever you're doing in your work. And so, for instance, when COVID first happened, I was taking on a lot of that responsibility because um, my team really... It was challenging for all of us, mm-hmm. um, but then as COVID kind of kept going, some of my staff were like, hey, I realize this isn't what I thought it would be, and I'd love to help out more, and so that was awesome because by that person assisting, that allowed me to kind of focus on things that were actually needed more of my attention. I mean, COVID's pretty serious, but needed more of my attention, and now this person on my staff and I work kind of in tandem, and they're so good that they've, they've been able to... Um, do a lot of things without my assistance. Now, clearly, if a if a unique situation comes up, then they'll ask me to step back in. Um, and so that, I think, is how I've poured from an open cup. I mean, I think, you know, whatever it is for you, and I think for me, it's mostly a weekly basis, whatever you need to do weekly that's just for you, that's going to regenerate you so that you can go back into work on Monday. Um, you know, also the question, if you're not getting the support you need, I, I try to develop relationships with my supervisors where I can be pretty direct and feel like there's mm-hmm. not going to be any sort of repercussions. And it's not that I'm trying to be mean, but um, supervisors aren't mind readers. And so right. I can't get upset at my supervisor if I'm not putting out what's what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling. Um, right. If I continue to get what I don't need, which I really haven't been in an environment like that, I think I'd probably reevaluate whether or not how long I was going to stay Mm -hmm. in that role or at that institution, depending Mm -hmm. on what was going on. And I know not everybody can leave, um, but sometimes at the end of the day, you do need to do what's best for you. Yeah. And the next question kind of ties in a sense, um, but how do you handle microaggression slash discrimination as a mid-level professional, especially from your supervisors slash higher-ups? Great question. That is such a good question. One of one of my pet peeves is uh, coming into an institution and something like that is happening from someone who is um, in a higher position for me. And as I chat with some other folks, kind of my peers about it, they're like, oh, well, that's just how that person is. And I'm like, mm, no, that's not an okay answer, <laughs> right? But I think a big piece is figuring out how can, how can this message be conveyed in a way that that person will hear and be open to hearing? Because I think sometimes me just storming into someone's office and saying, what you did there was not okay, and here's the five reasons why, mm-hmm. could just completely close their ears, right? And, that's, right? and that may not be the, the most effective. Now, sometimes we do have to disrupt in that moment, and there are times as a mid-manager, you may have to stick out your neck in that moment to disrupt what's happening. And I think you should in those moments. But when there are other times where you can have some conversations behind closed doors, where you're asking those questions, tell me more about why you responded in this way or what you were thinking there. Okay, I can see where you're coming from, but I also want you to think about maybe how this this person interpreted what you said or what you did, right? And help have some of those, those educational moments there as well. Sometimes that can also be more effective. Great response. 
How do you like your supervisees to ask you for help without it seeming as if you can't do our jobs or have too much on our plates? Great question. Uh, uh, go ahead, Natalie. Oh, okay. Sorry, Sean. Um, Thanks, one of my strengths is individualistic. And so I really try to get to know folks on an individual level, try to get to know what's important to them, what makes them tick. And part of the reason why I do that is so if a project comes along, um, or, you know, if we need to kind of redistribute the wealth of work, then I know that person gets really excited about doing an administrative task or whatever it is. And I know if I give it to them, they, they're, they're going to be able to do it well. Um, I think one of the things being a mid manager is you have to kind of, you kind of have to be at a certain level where you can see 3000 feet, but you have to be well enough into the weeds, not too deep in the weeds, but mm -hmm. at least a little bit. So you know how things are kind of playing out. Um, and so in terms of how I like my staff to ask for assistance, I mean, I think just trying to be honest with me is, is helpful um, because I don't want to assume and then make a wrong assumption and then you're frustrated with me because I assumed incorrectly. You know, if people are asking for help constantly, then it may need to be a conversation about is the way that the department's structured not working? You know, are you in a building that has a high conduct activity so therefore you can't meet these other needs that we needed to do because of another another reason and do we need to kind of reevaluate and redistribute so just because someone doesn't ask for help means i ever think that they can't do their, their job in fact i'd rather have folks ask for help mm -hmm. than me assume that oh i haven't heard nothing's going poorly so i'm assuming it's great yes. and then lo and behold i get an on-campus partner who's like hey, I've reached out to your staff, you know, three times for this X information and they haven't gotten it back to me. Correct. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to go see what's going on. You know, I want to give my staff member the benefit of the doubt. Right. But at the same time, it, it's a balance when someone across the university presents you with, you know, I've reached out so many times, I can't get what I need. Mm -hmm. So again, I'd rather people ask for help and be honest than, um, than just kind of keep plugging along and it'll eventually come to the surface. Our next question is, do you have any tips on how to protect staff members in your unit that report to you from getting projects and or tasks piled on them, especially when you have a group of staff that are good task managers? Oh, that one's hard. I've got some great staff members in my area and they know how to get it done and they are so skilled and it is not uncommon for one of my supervisors to reach out and, and to directly to them and say, I want you to be the representative on this committee, or I want you to do this other thing because you're so skilled at it. And so we have some very frank conversations with my supervisees and I say, I may not always be copied on the email, but I need you to let me know. Like that, you tell me what's going on and I'm going to ask you, hey, did you get any requests recently? Like, are you being asked, what are you being asked to do? So that way we can keep track of it ourselves. Right. And then if I need to go and advocate for yes. them, yes. then I'm doing that, right? And I yeah. can say, so-and-so is amazing. I'm so glad that you thought about them for this particular task, but actually, I have another staff member who's really wonderful at this kind of stuff and who is looking for more experience in this area. And so how about we invite them to this committee, right? Because sometimes you have kind of like your go-to people or your people that have been there for a while. So they're the names that always pop up into folks' heads, but it's important as a mid-manager to be looking for those opportunities that you can pull some of your newer folks into or people who are just wanting to branch out and kind of redistribute some of that so that more people are getting that experience. It's not following all on the same person or persons. How do you handle working with a supervisor with many years of experience, but those experiences do not necessarily relate to the current generation of students that we are currently dealing with? And though given suggestions of options related to this generation, it is not heard and or are dismissed. Yeah, I think, I think that is hard because it's almost like, how are you hinting that you're super, well, I don't know at what stage you may be at. You may be at the like indirect kind of hinting stage, or it may have gone on for so long that you just need to be a little bit more transparent about what people are thinking. You know, as that manage, middle, as that mid manager, you kind of have to be an advocate for both teams, right? And so, as you're advocating for the folks you supervise, if a decision comes down that your staff doesn't agree with, trying to advocate and explain 
to them how your supervisor feels or needed to make that decision or whatever it is. And so in terms of how do you kind of get them to see some things generationally that they may be missing out or just some, um, just some maybe knowledge areas that they're not as, as good in or, you know, know a whole lot about. I mean, I think CEHO is a good example. You know, you can say, hey, I don't know if you saw that presentation on XYZ. I know this is really important to the staff. And so maybe you can attend the presentation so you could kind of get, you know, an understanding of where they're coming from. Um, you know, I think that is one thing. I think when you talk about this stuff and you're one-on-ones, trying to explain some of where they're coming from and their needs, I think, I don't know, Rachel, if you want to add anything to that. I think that one is kind of a hard question. I don't know, Sean? No, not at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We'll move to our next question. Uh, what have you done to advocate for your staff of color where your colleague slash counterpart slash supervisor uh, might display microaggressions in response to how they show up at work and aren't willing to talk through their biases about their staff member? That's a big one. Yeah. That is a very big one, right? So I'm guessing if they aren't willing to talk through, maybe that means that you've tried to approach it, but they've just brushed it off. Um, and that can be concerning. And so, you know, part of it might be, well, who would they actually hear that message from? Who might be able to deliver that message better than what I can deliver it? So, um, for example, I might not be the right person <laughs> to talk to them. It may be our relationship. It might be my identities, right? Maybe I need to approach my colleague who has very similar identities to that person and ask them to help me have this conversation with them about what's going on, right? So if I've got those colleagues that I trust that I know are gonna come at it in a good way, they're gonna be able to support our staff of color, but we'll also be able to frame it in a way that maybe that other person can understand. And that's where I'm enlisting other allies to help have those conversations. And then, you know, sometimes we do need to follow our HR processes. So, you know, for some reason in housing, we don't think that we should do that. You know, we've done so much training on conflict resolution and um, how to stand up for, bi for, for bias, you know, and we do all of this. So we kind of think that we can handle it when there are processes at the institution that are there for a reason, that are there to be supportive, whether it's through HR or your ombudsman or whoever that may be. And sometimes it is looking into those process, processes and doing something more formal. And that's an important piece to consider as well. Kind of awesome. Sorry, kind of going off of that, that was my question. I appreciate um, your point of view, Rachel. Um, another part of that is like sometimes as entry level professionals, we are discouraged from using the HR process because then it comes off as if like, well, you haven't told the mid manager or even their supervisor that this is a problem or like you haven't approached them to give them time to rectify whatever feelings um, that you may have about the way they're acting or treating you. So I guess, how do you like, how do you navigate that when you are relying on your supervisor to have those conversations? And if you try to have those conversations, it seemed it's looked at as if you're going over your supervisor's head and their supervisor's head um, because the person who oversees everyone is the actual problem and no one's willing to engage in that conversation. So um, things just keep happening because they're looked at as if they're untouchable because they've been in that seat for so long. you can do you care if I step in Rachel go ahead um you know Brianna to answer your question I mean that I is a very challenging one and I feel like I'm saying that over and over again you know I don't know if there's an ombuds at your institution that could potentially and that could be a route to get some resolution without having to go to HR because I hear you when people say I'm going to HR whatever it was it may have been not as major but it heightens people's anxiety and it heightens expectations about what's going to happen you know Brianna I think you could depending on the political landscape of your institution, you could also go to that, your super, whoever is the issue, go to their supervisor. Um, you know, I would really kind of think through that before I did that, because again, sometimes 
people take that as I'm being told on or what, you know, they just get hard feelings. Um, but there's only so many avenues you can reach out to if HR, you know, is one that you, you don't want to go to. Um, and I feel like going to someone supervisor would probably be better than going to HR if that, if you don't want to go to HR. So I hope that helps a little bit. Thank you both. Um, Dennis Scott is another med manager that's in our group and he dropped some knowledge in our group chat. Dennis, by chance, would you like to jump in and talk about that? Yeah, um, I just, uh, one of the things that I uh, try to remind my staff members is that typically decisions aren't made like in a vacuum, right? There's always a meeting before the meeting and there's always a meeting after the meeting. And I've had to remind my staff that at some point you will be in the seat as a mid-manager and you will understand that um, because there's, it's just the way it works, right? Like some people may say it's political, but that's just the way that it is. And so you have to be very uh, strategic based upon some of the decisions that are made um, because it's chess, not checkers, right? And so you have to think two steps ahead. So I, ha I cannot stress how important it is to think two supervisors above, right? Like it's not about me making the decision, but I have to think about my supervisor and my supervisor supervisor. And so once you begin to understand that, it will help you along your journey. Again, I'm not an expert, but that was one of the best advices that I've ever learned thus far is like, know that before we make this decision, we've already talked about it. And then after the decision is made, we're gonna also debrief and talk about it again. So I just wanted to drop that um, for those that may be in a, either aspiring mid managers or those that are currently in that um, particular situation. Thank you, we appreciate you. For Tom's sake, we're gonna to continue to our top five takeaways. Yeah, so um, one of my top fives in terms of being a mid manager is you will live to see another day. So whatever is going on at your institution, you will come back to work on you know Monday and you will work through whatever the um, whatever the issue is. You know, if you're getting to a place where you're dreading to go to work or you have no motivation at work or things, um, whatever it may be, then maybe your current institution, for whatever reason, isn't just the place for you anymore and you need to do what's best for you. And no one's gonna look down upon you on leaving. Um, institutions do what's best for themselves as well. And so when you leave, they will hire someone um, in your place shortly thereafter. And so there's no point of killing yourself or, you know, making your life challenging um, if things aren't right for you wherever you're at. And one of mine is that your success is dependent on others, right? So dependent on others in that um, a lot of times they are putting into action the vision that, that you or your supervisors have created. Um, it's it's dependent on the success of your supervisor, right? So your supervisor needs to look good. That also is um, impending on your success. And um, it's important to treat all of these people well, to treat your people well. Sean said that earlier, that when you do that, when you foster those relationships and that collaboration and that skill development, that that's only gonna help you um, and your team succeed. Mm -hmm. um, one of mine I, that I added was staying connected in professional networks. I think it's important for you to kind of stay abreast of what's happening in the field um, because that kind of helps dictate a lot of decisions that are made. So you can kind of prepare for what's coming down the pipe in a sense. Um, the other piece is that it gives you an outlet. So someone that's not at your particular institution, but someone that's at another institution that you can process with those, those days that are long and it gets lonely in this seat. And sometimes you just need to win because you are human as well. Uh, one of mine is model the way. So if you want staff to trust you, you have to trust your staff first. If you want people to come to you about their mistakes, you have to be vulnerable and take responsibility for your own mistakes and show them how to do that. If you want staff to prioritize personal wellness, you have to model that by not sending emails in the middle of the night, right? Maybe work on your stuff in the middle of the night if you have to, but put a delay on it and send it the next morning, but model it, whatever you have to do, model it. If you want your staff to use critical thinking and good judgment skills, then you have to take the time to explain how you reached a decision and model what that looks like for them. 
And then finally, for opportunity and challenges and take advantage is that you have to put in the work, right? You just don't show up and think everything's already laid out for you. No, you got to put in the work, the effort, the energy. Your staff matches your energy. Your staff responds how you how you operate. It takes your whole operations for your area. Um, so I think it just ties into what Rachel said. You have to model the way. Um, the other piece is that you have to put in that work. So if your staff see you working hard, they're going to work hard. If your staff see you just coming in late, laid back, chilling, they're going to do the same thing. So it's a repeated behavior. So you have to lead at all times. So in closing, these are this is our contact information. Please feel free to reach out to us. We are here. We love to support. If there are any questions that we missed or didn't have opportunity to uh, respond to, please email us and we'll do our best to get back to you. Yeah, or even if you just want to get together to like problem solve, like, hey, this is what's going on with me, you know, or just talk through or, or commiserate or come up with creative ideas, we're happy to do that as well. So thank you very much for attending. And uh, big props to Natalie, who's also moving today and still showed up for the presentation. So part of balancing everything, right? So thank you. I appreciate you, Rachel and Sean. <laughs> it was a pleasure.